Hi everyone, my name is uh, Kylie Papalato. I am a researcher at QUT in the IP and Innovation Law Group. Um, there's my details. Uh, this year I've been working on, our, um, on a project that we have an ARC discovery project on 3D printing and intellectual property. Um, and what I want to do today is just share some of the early empirical work that we've been doing as part of that project. As uh, Professor Norgard was uh, just explaining to us, 3D printing is really interesting because it sits at the nexus of these different areas of IP law and it, it disrupts the kind of silos we have around these different areas of IP law. Um, but having said that, today I'm going to focus just on, on one of these silos, on the one there in the pink, um, copyright law, and um, what we've been finding with 3D printing and copyright law. So just as a little bit of background, um, just to add on to the previous presentation, there will be often copyright issues with 3D printing particularly around, around artistic works. So um, I've got there an image of fashion, of a of drawing of a coat, because traditionally this was where we saw this sort of 2D to 3D types of reproduction. You would have copyright in the drawing of the, um, in this case, fashion item, which would be protected as an artistic work, which prevents uh, copying of that drawing without permission from the copyright owner or a legal excuse. And that can include uh, 3D copying of that 2D work. So actually making that item of clothing can be a copyright infringement of the drawing of that item of clothing. And we, are stu we see similar issues with 3D printing and artistic works and design files there. Because in the artistic realm, many non-functional uses of 3D printing, so I mean uses that aren't really uh, mechanical uses, draw on a lot of pop culture and fan art. Uh, th and this is particularly in that sort of low-level community use of 3D printing. Um, I I'll be talking today about some of the empirical work we've been doing with makers and in maker spaces. And with uh, those creators, there's a lot of um, printing of figurines and items and costumes derived from movies, games, from TV shows. Um, so you can see there we have uh, the figure, figurine of Groot and the Hulk from the Marvel Universe. There is Mario there. Um, that one in the gray is a character from Overwatch, which is a game put out by Blizzard. There's a lot of engagement with this sort of pop culture. And um, it's, it can be a little bit risky because most of the copyright is owned by very large companies who can be quite litigious, particularly when they have existing merchandising markets that might be impacted by 3D printing. So this is not a 3D printing example, but one example is that Nintendo has been um, very controlling over how Mario and um, that sort of Mario universe is portrayed. So they will go after costumes. Um, this was a a company in Japan that would take people on like go-kart tours around Japan and you could dress up and they did it as a sort of like Mario Kart activity um, and, and that got shut down through legal action by Nintendo. So um, the extent to which people are able to engage in sort of costumes and uh, figurines and other pop culture references around some of the movies and uh, comic books and games that they love is really under question with 3D printing and copyright law. It's, it's problematic because they're not just uh, printing these things for themselves, they are sharing the design files and sometimes selling the files or selling uh, the actual objects that are 3D printed on websites like Thingiverse, um, like My Mini Factory, 
or the Shapeways Marketplace. So these are all online sites where users can connect, share design files, and share the actual items. So um, it's still quite early days. We haven't seen a lot of case law around this yet, but there are issues, um, as we were just hearing, around how, um, how copyright law will respond to people sharing these um, files and also objects on these sites, both for the makers themselves in terms of direct infringement and the website hosts and intermediaries in terms of intermediary liability. Uh, this is pretty much one of the only case examples we have. Um, those of you who have been to our events before might have seen um, Matt talk about this. But um, I'm not sure how many of you remember, if you could play the video. This is Katy Perry's performance from the Super Bowl a few years ago. If you watch the left shark, if we might just roll it again. Just watch the left shark. If you watch closely, you notice that the left shark is just all over the shop. Very unco, didn't know what he was doing, just kept doing all the moves wrong. Um, and this, people who were watching this performance noticed this and it really captured their imagination. People fell in love with left shark and just how useless he was. We can go back to the slide. So this developed into a meme which developed into costumes, and then um, a 3D printing file was uploaded to Thingiverse where you could 3D print the left shark figurine. Um, and Katy Perry's lawyers sent a cease and desist letter, threatened to sue over um, this 3D printed left shark claiming that um, Katy Perry had copyright in Left Shark and that this was a copyright violation. Um, it never actually went to court because it, it got a lot of attention on the internet and Christopher Sprigman, who is a professor at NYU, got involved on behalf of the uh, user who had posted the file on Thingiverse and wrote a scathing letter to Katy Perry's lawyers, essentially saying there's no evidence there's even copyright in this thing, and if there is, why does Katy Perry own copyright? She was just the singer. Um, and he said it was the internet, not Katy Perry, that made Left Shark. So um, there was pushback, and. Katy Perry's lawyers sort of backed away from this copyright claim. Um, last I heard, they were pursuing trademark, though, over various words and images to do with Left Shark. But that's pretty much one of the only really like legal um, altercations we've seen around 3D printing. But it's a good example to show that um, these can happen and that they may intimidate where, where there's users or makers that don't have a law professor from NYU come in, jump in to help them, this sort of situation could be very intimidating for them. So that was one of the things that we're investigating with this project, is going out to maker communities and maker spaces and talking to the makers there and just trying to understand, do they understand the copyright issues are they even aware of them? What do they think about them? What are the norms by which they're operating? And how much are those norms influenced by the law or vice versa? And are they facing the same or similar issues as other types of creators who are making and sharing their creations online? Um, and that really is a reference to this building on other empirical work that I did last year, uh, interviewing other types of creators, so particularly documentary filmmakers, remix artists, um, all sorts, painters, videographers, people who were um, using a part of somebody else's work in a new way, 
um, include sample musicians, remixes, that sort of thing. So um, the findings, just very briefly in that study, focused on the fact that um, creators were in general very, very confused about copyright law. They uh, frequently conflated Australian and American copyright law, which is similar in many ways, but there are some important differences, particularly around exceptions. They generally did not use the copyright exceptions because they didn't understand them um, and they were not sure about them. Getting actual permission from copyright owners, so licensing, was extremely hard. It was time consuming, it was expensive, uh, and that meant it was often prohibitive for them. So they relied a lot on just flying under the radar and trying to make sure that their potential infringement went unnoticed. They also had their own sort of rules of engagement with work that diverged from the law in some very important ways. So they often had very strong ideas around the role of money and that when something was commercial or non-commercial, non-commercial use they thought was okay, commercial use not so much, um, in Australia, unlike in Europe, we don't have that distinction in the law. So it doesn't matter generally for the exceptions or for infringement whether your use is commercial or not. Uh, and the creators also focused on what they had added. So the creativity they had brought to the project to take that existing work and make it into something different rather than um, what they had taken from the existing work. But copyright law, because it's focused on the copy, only really looks at what's taken, not what is added. So I've just got back from uh, fieldwork in the US where I went to Boston and visited a bunch of makerspaces there, including at Microsoft and MIT and some community spaces, interviewing makers there, um, and also in New York, where I went to the New York Maker Fair, the Shapeways office, and again, some maker spaces. Additionally, uh, both Professor Rimmer and I have been doing interviews in Australia, here in Brisbane and elsewhere in Australia. Uh, Professor Rimmer went to Canada, and we hope to do some more interviews in Europe talking to makers about their experiences. Uh, so what I want to do is to present some of our preliminary kind of observations and trends from the data we're collecting. And I, I do want to emphasize that these are preliminary because we haven't gone through the full data analysis yet. Um, but these are just some of the trends that we're seeing come out. So firstly, understanding of copyright law in the maker communities, not so good. Generally, um, they are a bit confused about IP law. Interestingly, many of the makers that I've spoken to, they, they came to 3D printing from a normally a computer software background, uh, so, or a gamer background. So they're kind of familiar with open source licensing already, which doesn't necessarily mean that they understand copyright law or they know copyright law, but they uh, feel that they do, and so they're not so worried about it as the creators I spoke to last year. Um, they kind of know it's there, but it's something that they feel like they've been dealing with for a while. Um, as, as we've heard, sites like Thingiverse use open licensing, like Creative Commons, extensively. The, the most common license on Thingiverse is the non-commercial Creative Commons license. And because many makers are just printing for their own use in their home, that means they fall within the non-commercial requirement and they're fine. What that seems to mean for the makers I've spoken to is that they get quite blasé about the, the legal restraints around what they do. They assume that they always fall within the license, um, that everything on Thingiverse is open source. They kind of start to just ignore the licenses and the icons that are there on the website. Um, they're not really reading them or necessarily understanding the terms. 
um, and, and when they upload to Thingiverse, they uh, may be choosing to put their uh, designs under Creative Commons without really thinking about what that means. I have spoken to some makers who, who were more careful and did actively seek out either public domain or um, properly open sourced content to create design files and print things so that they weren't getting in trouble. Um, but the vast majority were, were not too worried. Um, an interesting legal issue that I think comes up here is that a lot of the designs that are shared may not actually be under copyright protection at all because they are functional items or for various reasons to do with the different intersections of the law. They're not really copyright at all, um, but they're still being put under these open source licenses, which on the one hand is good because it may act as a signal to people that it's okay to use this object or this design, but it also means that people are asserting control over things that they don't actually have control over, which may be a concern. Um, there was, there's been similarities between the makers I've spoken to this year and the creators I've spoken to last year around their ideas of commercial and non-commercial use. Um, it all seems to fit into a, a trend that's been documented elsewhere in the, in the literature around um, this sort of moral value that's sometimes ascribed to um, to doing to creativity that doesn't comprise of selling out. So it, it is kind of goes directly against the creator's own financial interests. These ideas that um, you're more authentic as a creator if you're somehow struggling or if you're not engaged in the dirty commerce of it all. Um, and makers sort of engaged in this in interesting ways. So one person I interviewed um, had created a file for a, a lighthouse um, model, which they had put up online and had deliberately designed a flaw into this model to make it less commercially appealing to somebody who might want to just print it and sell it. Um, so, so they were in, um, kind of doing that in, in interesting non-legal ways. Uh, they were also struggling with a lot of these ideas around what we call romantic authorship, as I just alluded to. So, um, as a creator, are they less creative if they're 3D printing? Um, do other people recognise the work that goes into modifying existing files to create something new? Um, if they're, so, if they're making models, say, is it more creative um, and therefore more authentic to have to have filed down and painted the model afterwards rather than just straight printing? And, and this was the same for cosplayers with costumes. Um, there was dis there's disagreement within the community about whether you're a real cosplayer if you are 3D printing your costume rather than making it from <laughs> wood and craft materials and those sort of things. Um, there was a lot of talk around cosplay. Um, so that's when people make the costumes and dress up as, as figures from movies or games or whatever. Um, it's unclear the extent to which copyright law works here, but it seems like in some cases doing this could be copyright infringement. Um, creating these costumes and dressing up as characters from movies or games. Um, nobody really knows, but it kind of operates in this space of what we call tolerated use. So this is use that is sometimes implicitly or even actively encouraged by the rights holders because it's good for them to build up these fans, but they don't actually give permission. They don't actually license the use, which means that they can at any point decide that they don't like what's going on. And they, they have really sort of inconsistent enforcement. So sometimes they will send takedown notices to people um, who have shared files on, on sites like Thingiverse 
A lot of people I spoke to had stories where their file got taken down, but their best friend had a file that was almost the same and that wasn't taken down, and how is that fair? Um, so this was something that um, came out a lot. Uh, and I did just want to highlight, too, that this is not a new phenomenon. We've seen this before. It happens in fan fiction, where authors may encourage fan fiction right up to the point where they don't like it. So some authors will like fan fiction, except they don't like slash fiction, which is what it's called when you have um, storylines that do romantic pairings of characters, which aren't, aren't in the original story. Often this will be um, gay romantic storylines, so that sort of Kirk Spock um, fan fiction, um, this kind of thing. The authors will sometimes be okay with it, sometimes not. Um, we also saw it early days of the internet around what is called machinima. So these were little cartoons made from games. The most famous one was Red versus Blue, which were the characters from um, a game called Halo, sort of soldier characters. So people made um, comedy videos of the, of the soldiers sort of standing around going, oh, you know, this is boring, waiting, 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 and, and made sort of com comedy using the files of the, um, from the actual game. Again, encouraged by the owners, but never actually licensed. Um, if it was licensed, then the license was always revocable at will, and there were weird terms. So Microsoft said, um, yeah, you can do this as long as there's no objectionable content, but they never define what objectionable content was, so presumably it's just whatever they feel like. Um, which creates extremely precarious situations for users um, while still retaining a great deal of power and control for the copyright owners. Um, and just super quickly before I finish off, sorry. Um, there is some interesting empirical um, stuff coming out too around intermediary liability and the online platforms. Um, so for example, uh, they will they get lots of DMCA copyright takedown notices. Um, Shapeways, this is all in their transparency report which is available online. About one third of their notices are for trademarks, not for copyright. But um, there are people sending notices that look like they're copyright notices, but they're really for trademarks. And there's an existing scheme that operates for copyright, but not for trademark. Um, and as Professor Norgard was saying, um, trademark, it's not clear that the intermediaries even have to worry about it. And if it's not used in commerce, then it doesn't really matter. But the intermediaries are finding that they have to develop policies around trademark and taking things down when the law is unclear. But sometimes they value this ambiguity in the law because just like with copyright owners, it gives them a little bit of leeway to do what they want to do anyway with their, with their user base in terms of implementing their own policies. Um, and just as a final observation, one thing that um, a lot of people talked about in the interviews, which I found interesting, was that a few people remarked, people don't really know how to use 3D printers in creative ways yet. At the end of the day, they're, they're a replicator, but how do we use them creatively? There was a lot of maker spaces with 3D printers just sitting there, people not really using them. So I think it's still very much in its infancy around how 3D printers will be used in creative and artistic ways and what copyright law will have to say about that. So sorry if I was a bit over time. <laughs>